Well, good evening, all. Are you ready for a bedtime story? I read this to my husband this afternoon. I've read it several times, a story from the life of Dr. Paul Yangi Cho. And I get so tickled every time I read this because it is so inspiring and it is so real and genuine the way he tells his story. He was a Buddhist, in case you didn't know, and in Korea, and he was dying of tuberculosis, and a young Christian girl came and began to witness to him, and he received Jesus as his Savior. And then he began, some time later, to do... Um, church services in the city slum among all the poor. And he was just as poor as they were. So just think about this precious young man beginning his ministry, still learning about this walk of faith himself. And we'll look in on this little conversation he had with God and the result. Are you ready? Oh, Father, I thank you tonight that joy and, and encouragement shall come from this rehearsing of the story of Dr. Cho. Oh, Lord, thank you, Father, that again, even with him, it wasn't try, it was trust. It was putting the seed of your word in and incubating it and seeing it bear fruit in a desk, a bed, a desk, a chair, and a bicycle. And so, Father, I thank you tonight for this wonderful testimony. In Jesus' name, and how it is inspiring after all these years. Hallelujah. He being dead, yet carries on the ministry through his books and his words. This book I'm reading from, The Fourth Dimension, Dr. Cho, was written in 1979. My goodness, think how long ago that's been. And here we sit tonight reading his story. Hallelujah. Incubation, the law of faith. God will never bring about any of his great works in your life without coming through your own personal faith. Well, that was a very thought-provoking statement. God will not never bring about any of his great works in your life without coming through your own personal faith. That goes back to the fact that God is a gentleman. Hallelujah. He doesn't force his great works upon us. We are laborers together with him in it. It is taken for granted that you do have faith. For the Bible says that God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. You have faith whether you feel it or not. I thought that was interesting. You have faith whether you feel it or not. You may try to feel faith, but when you need faith, then faith is there. It is there for your use, like having two arms. When you need to use them, you just reach out to them. I had a phone call come in. I think it caused the connection to get disrupted. Hallelujah. There are, however, certain ways your faith works. 
and links you to your Heavenly Father who dwells within you. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. I just hate it seeing that glare in my glasses and I'm trying to get around it the best that I can here. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, a substance which first has a stage of development, hmm, of incubation, before its usage can be full and effective. You might ask, what are the elements needed to make my faith usable? There are four basic steps to the process of incubation. Tonight I just want to share the first one with you. Envision a clear-cut objective. That's why we're going to talk about a statement from Andrew's book, The Power of Imagination. Envision or imagine a clear-cut objective. First, to use your faith, you must be able to envision a clear-cut objective. Faith is the substance of things. Clear-cut things hoped for. If you have only a vague idea about your goal, then you are out of touch with the one who could answer your prayer. You must have a clear and defined faith goal. I learned this lesson in a very peculiar situation. Now this isn't a story about healing in particular, but the principle that he's sharing, really, you can use it for healing, you can use it for anything, you'll see. I had been in ministry for quite a few months, months now, and was so poverty stricken that as far as material things are concerned, I had nothing. I was not married, and I was living in one small room. I had no desk, no chair, and no bed, and was eating on the floor, sleeping on the floor, and studying on the floor, but walking miles and miles every day to carry out soul winning. So I would say he was rather in a the bottom, at the bottom of the bottom, wouldn't you? So just apply that now to whatever you may be dealing with physically. What is the point of our little story here? So you can go to bed thinking about the power of God. And we're going to see how God's power brought this young man out of this situation that he was in, having nothing. One day, while reading my Bible, I was tremendously impressed by God's promises. Now that is good. I was tremendously impressed by God's promises. Hmm. The Bible said that if I would just put my faith in Jesus, praying in his name that I would receive everything. Put your faith in Jesus. See, what were we talking about even? It's not try, it's trust. Just keeping your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. The Bible also taught me that I was the Son of God, a child of the King of Kings and of the Lord of Lords. So I said, Father, 
Why should a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords live without a desk, a chair, a bed, a, a desk, a chair, and bed, and walk mile after mile every day? At least I should have a humble desk and chair to sit on, and a humble bicycle to ride on to do my home visitation. Just think about, he's an oriental person. Everything humble, thankful. So that was how he approached to God and how he approached the things that he needed. I need a humble chair and a humble desk. Isn't that precious? I felt that according to scripture, I could ask for these kinds of things from the Lord. I felt that according to scripture, now remember, this is his first attempt at believing God for something. He basically has had no teaching of any kind, and he has seen a promise in the scripture. So his faith has been quickened. He's caught a vision of a desk, a chair, and a bicycle. <laughs> I felt that according to scripture, so he had the right foundation here, according to scripture, I could ask for these kinds of things from the Lord. I knelt down and prayed. Father, now I am praying. Please send me a desk, a chair, and a bicycle. I believed and praised God. From that moment on, I was waiting for the delivery of each thing I had prayed for. A month passed, a month with no answer. Then two, three, four, five, six, and still no answer. Still I was waiting, and nothing happened. Then one rainy day, I was really depressed. Feel like he's telling your story? Hallelujah. Mm, I love this story. Then one rainy day, I was really depressed. And not having any food by that evening, was so hungry, tired, and depressed, I started complaining. Lord, I asked you to supply me with a desk, a chair, and a bicycle several months ago. But you have not supplied me with any of those things. Now, you see me as I am here preaching the gospel to the poverty-stricken people in this slum area. How can I ask them to exercise faith when I cannot even practice it myself? How can I ask them to put their faith in the Lord and truly live by the word and not by bread? My father, I am very discouraged. I am not sure about this, but I do know I cannot deny the word of God. The word must stand. And I am sure that you are going to answer me. But this time, I'm not just sure when or how. If you are going to answer my prayer after my death, what kind of profit would that be for me? Isn't that precious? If you're going to give me a desk, a chair, and a bicycle after I die, what profit is that? Oh, childlike faith. Childlike. Isn't that returning to our fir first love, Jesus said. I worship, worship you, Lord. If you are going to answer my prayer after my death, what kind of profit will that be for me? If you are ever going to answer my prayer, please speed it up, please. Then I sat down and began to cry. Aw. I can just see him, that little room, completely bare, no food, sitting on the floor, no bed, no chair, no bicycle, no desk. And in six months, no sign of him. Sits down and starts to cry. Suddenly, I felt a serenity. 
and a feeling of tranquility came into my soul. Whenever I have that kind of feeling, a sense of the presence of God, he always speaks. So I waited. Then that still small voice welled up in my soul. And the Holy Spirit said, My son, I heard your prayer a long time ago. Well, right away I blurted out, Then where are my desk, my chair, and my bicycle? The Spirit then said, Yes, that is the trouble with you and with all my children. They beg me, demanding every kind of request, but they ask in such vague terms I cannot answer. I just think about different things that you need in your life. Not just speaking of healing in particular. Not being vague in our requests. It takes a lot of faith, a lot of um, courage to say, Lord, I need $10. Lord, I want a red car. Lord, this to be specific about our prayers instead of just generalizing things. So that's the lesson we can be learning from this, even with your healing. Call out the member you need healed, you know. Hallelujah. The Lord said, don't you know that there are dozens of kinds of desks, chairs, and bicycles? But you simply asked me for a desk, a chair, and a bicycle. You never ordered a specific desk, chair, and bicycle. <gasps> hmm, he said, that was a turning point in my life. Very interesting. That was a turning point in my life. No professor in the Bible college ever taught me along these lines. I had made a mistake, and it was an eye-opener for me. I then said, Lord, do you really want me to pray in definite terms? This time the Lord led me to turn to Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Faith is the substance of things, clear-cut things hoped for. I knelt down again and said, Father, I'm sorry. I made a great mistake and I misunderstood you. I cancel all my, my past prayers and I'll start all over again. Isn't that precious? I just love his sweet spirit before the Lord. So, I gave the size of the desk. Now that's specific. I gave the size of the desk, which was to be made of Philippine mahogany. Ooh, ooh. I wanted the best kind of chair. One made with an iron frame and with rollers on the tips so that when I sat on it, I could push myself around my room like a big shot. <laughs> Then I came to the bicycle, and I really gave much consideration to the matter because there were so many kinds of bicycles, Korean, Japanese, Formosan, and German. But in those days, bicycles made in Korea or Japan were usually flimsy. I wanted a very strong and sturdy bicycle. And since any machine made in the U.S. was the best, I said, Father, I want to have a bicycle made in the USA. Now, you can imagine this experience. This book was written in 79, and by that time he was pastor of the largest church in the world. So I'd say he had come a long way from these days when he was asking for a bicycle, a chair, and a desk. <clears throat> so just think about how many years before 1979 this happened. 
I ordered, oh, he says, Father, I want to have a bicycle made in the USA with gears on the side so I can regulate the speed. I ordered these things in such articulate terms that God could not make a mistake in delivering them. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Then I felt faith, oh, flowing up and out of my heart. And I was rejoicing in the Lord, and that night I slept like a baby. But when I awoke at 4.30 the next morning to prepare for the early morning prayer meeting, I suddenly found that my heart was empty. The evening before, I had all the faith in the world. But while I slept, faith took wing and left me. This is his first time, his first experience, remember, at this sort of a thing. So let's just keep listening and not criticize his theology at this point. The evening before, I had all faith in the world. But while I slept, faith took wing and left me. I could not feel anything in my heart. I said, Father, this is terrible. It is one thing to have faith. Hmm. But it's entirely different to keep that faith till I receive your answer. That's where the not try but trusting, living in that trust comes in. This is a trouble common to all Christians. They have a special guest speaker and are filled with faith when he ministers to them. But before they reach their homes, they have lost it all. Their faith takes wing and flies away. See, we could say it's not maybe faith necessarily, but the enemy comes and steals that word immediately. That's what Jesus said. On that morning, while I was reading the Bible and looking for a particular scripture to speak on, Suddenly, my eyes fell on Romans 4.17. God raises the dead and calls things that be not as though they were. Oh, my heart fastened to that scripture. Did you hear that? Isn't that my heart fastened to that scripture? That's why I encourage you to Read slowly, feeding, feeding, giving your heart a chance to fasten on a scripture. My heart fastened to that scripture and it began to boil in my heart. I said to myself, I might as well just call those things which are not as if they were as if I already had them. That's that. I can just see him too. I had received the answer to my problems of how to keep my faith. Isn't that awesome? I had received the answer to the problem of how to keep my faith. Speaking the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And we keep our faith by speaking it, declaring that's why we do declarations and confessions of faith. I rushed out to our tent church where the people had already begun praying. And after a few songs, I started preaching. I expounded that scripture and then said, Folks, by the blessings of God, I have a desk made of Philippine mahogany, a beautiful chair with an iron frame and rollers on the tips, and a bicycle made in the USA with gears on the side. Praise God, I've received all these things. Thank you, Lord. I remember the days when I first, first in my faith walk and the word of God had first fastened onto my life. I think if the word had said the sky was purple, I'd have said, I'd have started telling everybody the sky is purple because the word said it. You're just in that fresh 
excitement. Hallelujah. And the Lord wants us to keep that. Praise God. Whew. The people gasped. <gasps> what? Because they knew that I was absolutely poverty stricken. I was bragging about these things and they could not believe their ears. In faith, I was really praising God, doing just what the Word of God told me to do. Well, after the service, it's going to get better now. After the service, as I was walking out, three young fellows followed me and said, Pastor, we want to see those things. Oh, I was suddenly taken aback and frightened because I had not counted on having to show any of these things. These people were living in a slum area, and once they knew I had lied, it would be my last time to minister there. They would never come back. I was in a terrible situation, so I began to pray to the Lord. Lord, from the beginning, this wasn't my idea. It was your idea. For me to tell it like that, I just obeyed you, and now I'm in a terrible situation. I said it is as if I had it, and now how can I explain this? You've got to help me. Isn't that precious? So the next time you get in a fix like that, you know what to do. Lord, you've got to help me. Then the Lord came and helped me. And an idea floated up from my heart. I said, you come over to my room and see. Well, they all came. And they looked around to find the bicycle, the chair, and the desk. I said, don't look around. I'll show it to you later. I pointed my finger at Mr. Park, who is now pastor of one of the largest Assemblies of God churches in Korea, and said, I'll ask you a few questions. And if you can answer my questions, I'll show you all of those things. How long were you in your mother's womb before you were born into this world? We could pretend now like we're Mr. Park. Think about these questions coming to us. How long were you in your mother's womb before you came into this world? He scratched his head and said, well, nine months. I then replied, what were you doing for nine months in your mother's womb? Oh, I was growing, he said. But, I said, no one saw you. No one could see me because I was inside of my mother. Then I said, you were as much a baby inside your mother's womb as you were when you were born into the world. You gave me the right answer. Last evening, I knelt down here and prayed to the Lord for that desk, chair, and bicycle. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, I conceived that desk, chair, and bicycle. <laughs> It is as if they're inside me, growing right now. See, and what have we been talking about? Planting the Word of God daily in your heart so it can grow up and you don't have to be concerned about how. It'll, in time, bring a harvest of health and a life of wellness. You're pregnant with it. You're carrying, birthing it. That's why it's important for you to have a clear-cut envision, your clear-cut objective of a life of wellness. <clears throat> I knelt down here and prayed to the Lord for that desk, chair, and bicycle, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I conceived it. It is as if they're inside me growing right now. And they are as much a desk, a chair, and a bicycle 
as when they will be seen by people at the time of their delivery. So just think about a baby. Nine months in the mother's womb is just as much a human being then as when it's seen. They started laughing and laughing. I can just see this scenario, can't you? They said, this is the first time we've ever seen a man pregnant with a bicycle, a chair, and a desk. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy. It's like the Lord got him out of the frying pan and into the fire. Wait to hear the rest of this. Running out of my room, they began to spread the rumor all over town that the minister was pregnant with a bicycle, a chair, and a desk. I could hardly walk through that town because the women would gather to look at me and giggle. Mischievous youngsters would come to me on Sunday and touch my stomach and say, Pastor, how big you are becoming. But all those days, I knew that I had every one of those things growing inside me. It just takes time. As a mother takes time to give birth to a child, it takes time for you too, because you become pregnant with all of your clear-cut objectives. I was praising the Lord, and sure enough, when the time came, I had every one of those things. I had exactly all the things I had asked for. A desk made out of Philippine mahogany, a chair made by the Japanese Mitsubishi Company with rollers on the tips so that I could roll around when I sat on it, and a slightly used bicycle with gears on the side from an American missionary son. I brought that desk, chair, and bicycle into my house and was completely changed in my prayer attitude. Until that time, I had always prayed in vague terms. But from that time until now, I have never prayed in vague terms. If God were ever to answer your vague prayers, then you would never recognize that the prayer was being answered. You must ask definitely and specifically. Now I want to go over to Andrew's book. I just opened this last night. I keep going back to this periodically because this reality of imaginations, the power of imagination needs to be constantly refreshed in our thinking. So I get Andrew's book out quite often and just rehearse the things in it, especially the first that, that he said, the imagination is your spine on which you're building your life, which you build your life. Anyway, he's talking here. During the Great Recession of 2008, when stock prices went down 50% and the housing market crashed, the Lord spoke to me about building a world-class Karis Bible College campus. Since that time, we've purchased and begun development on 493 pristine mountain acres in Woodland Park, Colorado. We've spent over 70 million above my normal expenses building a 70,000 square foot building called The Barn to house our Karis classrooms and a 140,000 square foot building that includes a 3,200 seat auditorium, our phone center and our Karis offices. And we have renovated another 60,000 square foot building on the property for our AWM offices and television studio. All of this was done debt free. While everyone else was struggling 
and just barely getting by during the, quote, Great Recession of 2008, we were prospering. We were building. There's no natural explanation for this. We didn't take out a loan or tap into investor funds. We didn't have a huge amount of savings to draw from. All we had was God's word. Oh my. We let the word of God paint a picture of what was possible, of what we could do. And that picture has become so clear and so strong that we can no longer live outside of it. That's the phrase that really hit me. That clear-cut objective has become so clear and so strong, strong. First, they were trying to grip the clear-cut objective. Now it has gripped them. You may still be trying to get a grip on you living a life of wellness. But if you will keep meditating, standing on God's word, planting God's word, and letting that, how did he say it? We let the word of God paint a picture of what was possible. Having a life of wellness, let the word of God paint your picture of you having a life of wellness. And that picture has become so clear and so strong that we can no longer live outside of it. So first they were trying to get a grip on the clear-cut objective, but they've stayed at it so long and it has become so clear in their mind and so strong in their life that now it has got a grip on them. I just keep hearing those words going over and over inside of me. We can no longer live outside of it. We can no longer live outside of it. It has become so clear and so strong that we can no longer live outside of it. So their whole life is living in a cycle of moving in that clear-cut objective. No longer live outside of it. Their everyday life is totally geared and controlled by that clear-cut objective that God has given him for ministry. Then he says, You see, faith and imagination work hand in hand. The title of this chapter is Narrow-Mindedness, and that can seem a negative at times, but he's turning it around. He said you can get so focused and so narrow-minded on Scripture that you can't see anything contrary to it, and that is a positive thing. Hallelujah. <clears throat> then I want to go to verse in Jeremiah. I just happened to let my Bible fall open the other day and I started reading Jeremiah. I've been reading in the Old Testament some. Jeremiah 33. Call unto me. Many of you have heard this verse before. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. Then it's speaking of the healing of Jerusalem and Israel. Behold, they were going, getting ready to go off into bondage or already were, I'm not sure which, bondage to the Babylonians or something, getting invaded, carried off captive. But the Lord says, I will bring it health and cure, and I will cure them and reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. That's one of our scriptures in the 101 healing verses. I will bring you health and cure, 
and I will cure you, and I will reveal to you the abundance of peace and truth. And it shall be to me a, a, a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth. Your healing will be a joy before the Lord, will be a joy to him, and it will be a praise and an honor unto him in all the earth. Hallelujah. Then going over here. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing that I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch, speaking of Jesus, the branch of righteousness, to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days, now we're speaking of when Jesus returns even to the earth. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. We know what goes on over there these days if you watch the news. That's why we're encouraged to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And listen to this, the Lord is going to give Jerusalem a new name, he says here. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she, Jerusalem, shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Hmm. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Speaking of Jesus again, he'll be seated on the throne of David when he returns. Then I read on down. I thought, oh, I enjoyed all those verses. You know, I can see God, hallelujah, the covenant he made with Abraham. He's a covenant-keeping God. He said, I'll bless you. I'll make your descendants like the stars of heaven, etc., etc. I've heard stories in the past about a queen, queen of England, and she asked her spiritual advisor. Can you tell me in one word why the Bible's true? And he said, the Jew, madam, the Jew. <clears throat> Jesus came from the house of Judah. That's where the word Jew comes from, Judah, the word, the tribe of Judah. And the Lord made a covenant with the Lord Jesus. Father, God made a covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ, his New Testament, the New Testament of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you read in Revelation, he will come back and set his feet upon the Mount of Olives and he will rule and reign for a thousand years from Jerusalem. So going on down here, that's and the Lord swore to David, if you read David's life, the Lord promised him, he said, you will never want for a man to sit upon your throne. So I was leading all of these, and then thinking about us, yes, and our some verses that could apply to us and our healing, but then I was viewing this as what God had said to Israel. And I got on down here, how God's a covenant-keeping God. He's a... He doesn't let any word that he has said go unfulfilled. He's a covenant-keeping God. He watches over his word to perform it. By his stripes you were healed. That was a covenant made with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the guarantee of that covenant, of its fulfillment. That's like my posting I made earlier of the video, the legal and vital side of your redemption. He made covenant God. It's a covenant-making God. Then I got down here to verse 20, and I was absolutely speechless. It says, Thus says the Lord, If you can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the, of the night, that there should not be day and night, in their season. Then may also my covenant be broken with David, my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne. As the host of heaven 
cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant. Thus says the Lord, if my covenant be not with day and night, I never heard such a thing before. I went back to Genesis, and God called the evening and the morning, day and night. He was making a covenant. And I thought about each of the six days of creation. Let there be light. Let there be birds. Let the earth bring forth. He was making a covenant with every one of those statements that he made. Let's listen to it again. Thus saith the Lord, if you can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night. Right now where I'm at, it's night. Where you're at, it may be day. Day and night continue. No man can break what God ordained when he said, when he divided the darkness from the light and made day and night. No man can break that. And I thought about how God keeps his word. God is a covenant-keeping God. This, the very existence of Israel today is a witness to you that God is your healer. That he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when he said in 1 Peter 2.24 that by Jesus' stripes you were healed, it was a covenant statement. So if you need to be encouraged about your healing and days you have symptoms or you're going through different things, every, wherever you live, it's going to be either day or night. That was Jeremiah 33, verse 20. I'll put it in the notes. But... Just look up at the sky. Is it daylight? Is it dark? Can I count on having daylight and dark tomorrow? Yes. Why is that? Because God made a covenant with the day, and he made a covenant with the night. And since the world began, all things have gone according to the covenant that he made with them. Day has never ceased. Night has never ceased. So if no man is capable of breaking a covenant that God has made with the sky, with the day and the night, how much more is he going to keep the covenant that he made with the Lord Jesus which, that provided healing for me through his stripes? See, encourage yourself. The day, the night, no. God keeps his word to the daytime. He keeps his word to the night. He keeps his word to the stars. Like I read something about that too, about the stars even. How God make a covenant with them when he set them in the sky. And they go in their courses where he ordained them to go. God is not a man. I was so blessed. I was telling my husband. When I... I think the Bible being a legal document is so real to me because not too long after I was saved, the lady that discipled me gave me Numbers 2319. I was going through a little stormy thing over something, shaking, crying, discouraged like Dr. Cho, trying to stand on one of the promises of God. I'd get inspired and then my Faith would take wings and fly away. She took me back to Numbers twenty three nineteen. God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man, born of man, that he should waver and change his mind from one day to the next. He has spoken, and he will do it. That's it. Not try, but trust. God's not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he changes his mind. He has said, he sent Jesus to bear the stripes for your healing. He has said it, he has put it 
in writing, in blood, if you want to say, in the New Testament. It's demonstrated in the ministry of Jesus and the apostles. It's demonstrated in the testimonies that you hear. Even Andrew Womack's healing journeys, it's testified to that God is not a man that lies. He said it. He's done it. He is doing it. He's keeping his covenant promise. Hallelujah. So we talked about Dr. Cho. Envision a clear-cut objective. We talked about the little phrase from Andrew. How they saw so clearly in their imagination what God told them to do to build a world-class Bible campus. And they envisioned it and meditated on it so long that and it became so clear in their imagination and their thinking and their words that pretty soon it got a hold of them. And the whole circuit of his life began to operate within the realm of that clear-cut objective that God had given them. And then we read in Jeremiah that God keeps, he's a covenant-keeping God, and he does not break his covenants. The covenant of your healing was made with the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is sitting there as your guarantee. Father, I guarantee, I am the living guarantee that's what in, that what is in this covenant belongs to them, and they can have it. Hallelujah. Oh, may this bedtime story just be a balm upon your heart, a rest to your body, an encouragement to your emotions, and food for your faith, and imaginations in your mind as you go to sleep thinking about the power of God you've heard about once again. Father, I thank you tonight for your word. Oh, God. What more can be said, Father? Let these things grab the hearts of those who hear them. Thank you, Father that they are encouraged and uplifted. And Father, the vision of you as being a God that watches over his word to perform it. A covenant, the covenant, keeping God, begins to ring like a bell in their hearts. Oh, Father, I thank you for it. Thank you, your word goes far and wide. And waters of living, living waters flow in dry places. And life comes forth in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Share my little story so someone else can have their heart encouraged. Be a seed sower with me. That's what I am, a seed sower for Christ. Good night, all. <laughs>